From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. It was an abrupt end to the legislative session. Senate President Teresa Piva Weed adjourned the state Senate after telling her members they were at an impasse with the House. And there were several big items left on the table, including the plan to toll truckers as a way to fund repairs to the state's crumbling bridges. We look back at the 2015 session and look ahead to priorities in 2016 or possibly sooner. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Senate President Teresa Piva Weed. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Madam President, really good to have you back on the show. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So I talked a lot about what didn't get done uh, at the top of the show there, but a lot did happen in the legislative session. Many bills got through the General Assembly. There was a smooth budget process uh, with a, a lot in there, including full day kindergarten. Uh, there was campaign finance legislation. Uh, enhanced penalties for sex trafficking, to name a few, and we're, we're probably going to get uh, to a few of those. But first, let's do talk about that abrupt end to the session. There's this perception that there's some tension between your Senate and Speaker Mattiello's House. What do you say to that? I think that I be have to begin by saying, as you did, about the very challenging issues that he and I worked together on uh, with the governor. Uh, that would include settling the pension suit, uh, as well as a very complex budget, and numerous economic incentives and education issues. That being said, at the end of the session, uh, we were did at an impasse, as you said earlier, on uh, several issues. The critical issue that ended the day um, was the issue that has been widely forecast on chicken cages. However, the issue that was far more disappointing was the speaker's decision to not support the governor's initiative regarding tolls. So he, he has talked about a special fall session for that. Um, and I know you've said well, you haven't seen any bill out of the House yet. You can't talk about coming back for a fall session uh, if that happens. But it looks likely that the trans transportation bill will be tweaked. Um, is it important enough to you to come back so the Senate can at least examine that bill for a fall session? Would you be open to it? At this juncture, the Speaker was quoted yesterday as saying he may pass the original bill uh, or he may tweak it. It would be uh, very premature for me to, at any juncture, consider a hypothetical. Uh, the legislation the governor proposed was modified significantly uh, to address the concerns of Rhode Island businesses. Uh, it is, in fact, a good, strong proposal with conservative estimates, uh, addressed every concern that was raised in the House and Senate committees. Are there always other ways to do it? Certainly. What I would be primarily concerned about is shifting the impact to Rhode Island businesses to satisfy the National Trucking Association. The fact of the matter is the legislation as it was modified really does keep um, a c concern for the greatest, the largest trucks. And once you get beyond the larger trucks, you start talking about diesel, start talking about anything else. Now you're talking about a lot of our small businesses in Rhode Island. You start having concerns, look where our studio is located, about over the border sales to Massachusetts. Um, and you're asking all Rhode Islanders to pay for something that statistically the federal government has demonstrated that about 70% of the damage is caused by the, the largest of the trucks, 90% if you went to the next class, six and seven. So at this juncture there, um, we've had two public hearings in the House and Senate. Uh, the governor and the DOT has run the numbers, and I'm satisfied that the plan that is before us is a good plan. But you, j to be clear, and you know reporters have to do this, you, I aren't, understand you aren't 100 percent ruling out returning, right? I You're, am actually at this point are. because it doesn't make sense. Change for the sake of change. Um, my caucus, I work as a team. I want to say that. We had a caucus. We took a tough position. We passed the legislation that the governor and the DOT worked very hard on. After we had every reason to believe, after standing under the bridge with the speaker, no alternatives had been raised. In fact, the very concerns we raised, the governor and DOT addressed every one. So at this juncture, 
change for the sake of change. I am very concerned about our public safety of our roads and our bridges, and I don't understand the reason for this delay. I am hopeful that the governor may be able to begin the process uh, as a possibility with the federal government uh, without the legislation, and that is always an option if, in fact, that's uh, possible. I'm sorry. I know she's researching that. Be, uh, begin the process with the federal government, meaning. Uh, in bring in tolls without the General Assembly? Begin necessarily getting the study. You can't bring I, tolls. I, that's what I thought. Okay, so but what has to happen is there has to be an investment grade study done in order to issue the bonds. So there needs to be a memorandum of understanding. That was one of the reasons the governor had come to both the speaker and I and asked if we could pass this legislation at this time, even though it wouldn't be fully implemented for another year and a half. Uh, so the question becomes, is it possible for them to begin that process and the legislation wait till January? I don't know the answer to that. I hope to be talking to her later today. I know she was going to research that. You're mm -hmm. being, uh, I would say, pretty candid about um, the disagreements between the House and Senate right now, which of course we like makes for good TV. <laughs> um, but you know, is, is this a worse um, relationship right now between the House and Senate than previously during your period, or is this, do you see this as just the normal legislative back and forth? I think it's a uh, democracy at its best. I mean, the whole process over the last six weeks with this legislation uh, was democracy at its best. Uh, changes were made. I think that there's going to be disagreements among leaders about policy, and uh, when you look at the things we agreed at, minimum wage increases, tip credit, once again, pension settlement, a complex budget that included a health care exchange, among other things. I think that what we agreed to this session was far more than what we didn't agree to. Our guest this week is Senate President Teresa Piva weed um, You brought up the press conference in which we were all standing, Ted and I were there, we were all standing under a crumbling bridge, no less, mm -hmm. and you stood by the speaker at the podium lauding the plan. Uh, did it surprise you at all when he put the brakes on? Yes. Yes. Why you do thought you, you had agreement? I thought that we were both, it was the governor's initiative. Sure. And so we, I thought we were both working with the governor. At one juncture, I actually thought um, she wasn't going to be able to address all our concerns and there had been speculation, including by myself, about the possibility of a special session. I have to give her and her team credit. They thought it was important enough that they went and dug in and came up with a second proposal, which was then heard in the House and Senate, which addressed those concerns. And it was pretty amazing because I was of the thought process, oh, we're never going to be able to get there from here. There's just too many concerns. She went back. They lowered the maximum amount of toll. They lowered the maximum amount of bond. They addressed one of the issues, which had been the long-term borrowing, by stating clearly that while these are revenue bonds, it would be very possible after 11 years to prepay those bonds. And given the conservative numbers they used regarding diversion and delta, uh, that's a real possibility. They extended that payment plan to 30 years in order to reduce the tolls. They created the Shippers Fund as well as an airport fund, which actually benefits all Rhode Island businesses. Uh, I was amazed the numbers, the proposals, and I have couple senators in my finance committee, uh, Chairman DuPont, Ryan Pearson, and Lou De Palma, and I trust them. They are numbers guys, and they went over that thing, and they asked the questions in the second hearing, and the second proposal worked, and so I felt very satisfied. After that hearing, the two issues which remained was prepayment, which could in fact be done you know, for 11 years, and we spelled it out even though that's typical of revenue bonds. And then the second issue was the DOT director alone making the toll process, and they had added language about requiring a public hearing, but the department, based on their research, was concerned the federal government requires uh, what they call the owner of the bridge to make that decision. What about the possibility of raising the gas tax, and Speaker Mattiello brought this up this week, and he, he was saying that maybe we could raise the gas tax and do tolls, so presumably to tolls would be less. Would you be open to both of those, raising the gas tax and tolls? We just raised the gas tax, and we're already higher than Massachusetts. Um, there's also a diesel tax, which I believe is what the Truckers Association is suggesting that we raise. If you raise the diesel tax to match Connecticut, 
you might generate 12 to 14 million dollars and that's a very high number because interestingly enough the revenue numbers that I've been able to look at throughout the last six weeks where I've learned more about trucks and gas taxes than I ever imagined <laughs> um, that what I found is that that's also paid by school buses and RIPTA so those actual revenue numbers would actually be less than the between six and seven hundred thousand per penny uh, that uh, the revenue forecasts show and that is once again assuming we raise it diesel 20 cents to match Connecticut which would make us far higher than Massachusetts and you once again run into that diversion and now you're looking at the box trucks you're looking at even some this cars sounds like a big old diesel. no to me <laughs> so I gotta tell you. <laughs> lots of concerns let me say that <laughs> okay. I, what I guess I'm trying to say is that it's not a new idea um, we have been really, we created a transportation fund. I lived through the Sakonet River Bridge toll, mm. and we looked at every source of revenue for motor vehicles. We looked at car registrations. We looked at inspections. We looked at uninsured motorists. We looked at the gas tax, and we did a little bit in all those areas to create the transportation fund. But even in taking those steps, the revenues being generated and the structural needs of our state uh, would not be met. We have been rated last business-wise and public safety needs to be our top priority. It takes a bold move, and I, the gas tax doesn't get us here from there. I have to ask there. you, um, you mentioned yourself the chicken cages, the chicken coop bill, um, pretty rough treatment by the Humane Society of Senator Sosnowski, who I know you're close to. Um, a number of people have said, particularly with the bills on charters and the Good Samaritan law expiring due to the breakdown, was it worth it over chicken cage regulation. What do you say to those folks? The Good Samaritan we need to get back and do as soon as possible. Um, I am heartbroken about that because the reason it was a little complex in that the House legislation just why don't we Why don't we let people sunset. know what the Good Samaritan bill oh, which is, no, no, it's... The it's, Senate has played a leadership role in ensuring the Good Samaritan, which um, legislation passed. At, last year last year was the first year but law enforcement had a lot of concerns so there was a sunset and the good samaritan bill allows people to call in the case of an overdose and be protected from prosecution okay i think in the simplest of yeah. terms um but we put a sunset because there was some concern from law enforcement as to whether or not that would happen so it was kind of like let's try it for a year and see if it works this year the house passed a bill that just um let in, remove the sunset so it would become permanent law. Our, the legislation the Senate passed actually expanded those protections a little bit to other people in the room because there were some concerns about the areas where the bill was working and where it wasn't working and if it was working. Um, so upon the recommendation of the people that were involved, be it the medical society and other folks, we did an expansion of those protections. So the bills were not similar. Unfortunately, we're not Washington. We don't have a conference committee to go hammer it out as some states do. Uh, as a result of those differences, that's why this did not pass. That being said, I expect we'll go back for judges. There's numerous judicial appointments to be made, and this will be a priority of one thing that we have to do. Um, on charter schools, the Senate had a great result, I think. Uh, Senator Gallo, Senator DuPont, uh, Senator Satchel, and Senator Pearson have been really the leaders on the charter school issue. That day, I, uh, at the request of the governor, she said, do you mind you know, if I meet with your folks? Because the legislation was moving, she had concerns. I said, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, she had a great meeting with them and talked about the fact that the real issue underlying uh, the problems with charter school, that this legislation made everybody publicly admit the discussion that happened because of this legislation was more important than the legislation. Because what we were able to see is that there is a problem with the funding formula. And even the charter school people admit, for example, when you do a per pupil cost. We have to go to a commercial break uh, first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is a problem with the funding formula, and the governor's committed to working with um, the legislature to address that in her next budget. Uh, and as we go to a commercial, you said you might come back uh, to deal with judicial appointments. Right. Is there a yeah. time frame for that, real, real quick? It'll start to run when the governor makes the appointments. So you may be back in the fall, but just not for transportation is what right. you're the saying point, The point is to go back um, for judges if necessary, which is common okay. with the Senate. Our guest is Senate President Teresa Piva. We, we have so much to talk about when we come back, including the Paw Sox. So stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Senate President Teresa Piper Weed. Madam President, we had Speaker Mattiello on uh, this program recently. He was very bullish about m the prospect of moving the Paw Sox to Providence. Are you more willing to walk away from the proposal than the Speaker is? Certainly the original proposal. Um, I have yet to find anyone that supports the original proposal other than those that made it. Um, it was, uh, you know, looking for $4 million a year subsidy to build a very nice ballpark, a miniature Fenway, um, but it was certainly not, I, I know among my senators, which I think are a real reflection of uh, their constituents, there was absolutely no support for the original proposal. Uh, the governor is, I think, together with Joe Azrak, who is the chair of the I-195 Commission, been negotiating. Uh, I don't know the current status of those negotiations, and what I have said is I uh, keep an open mind. But at this juncture, I haven't seen anything to indicate to me uh, that there is any realistic appetite anywhere uh, for this ballpark. They, you know, if they're doing this listening tour, I don't know much about it. it. I'm not particularly impressed by it because there's no proposal. It's not as if they have a proposal and they're out there shopping around a proposal. So uh, would you be willing to walk away, let the Paw Sox move out of Rhode Island if, if it came to that? Oh, yeah, if it's at $4 million, yes. I mean, I, they're very nice and everything, but yes. Uh, the proposal, absolutely. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I haven't heard a Rhode Islander that. And I'm a huge Red Sox fan. My husband and I shared tickets with some friends in Boston for ten years. I grew up in a baseball house. I have more Red Sox paraphernalia that I can't part with than you can imagine. <laughs> I love the Red Sox, but uh, you know we represent the taxpayers of this state. And at this juncture, for four million, you know, what the proposal they put out there. Now I know they're negotiating lower numbers, but. I think any proposal would have to have tons of hearings. I think it would have, we'd need to have an economic um, benefit analysis done of what is the benefit versus what they're asking for. The city of Providence would have to be involved. And in addition to the state subsidy issue, there's also permitting issues. That entire I-195 parcel was permitted uh, based upon drainage to that parcel. Uh, and I know a little bit's been written about that, but that's another issue. And then, you know, everybody's kind of glossing over it, but Narragansett Bay has that little tunnel underneath. So it seems to me they have a long way uh, to go before yeah. they get to any kind of realistic discussion. So my follow-up question seems almost pointless at this point, but uh, <laughs> it sounds like the, the Pawsocks say they'll, they might have a new proposal ready for this House toll special session this fall. The Senate will probably not be ready to take that up this fall? No, no. All right, I want to, uh, this week, uh, move on to uh, former Speaker Gordon Fox. He uh, reported to a federal prison to begin his uh, three-year sentence on public corruption charges. I want to step back a little bit. Um, you know, I know some legislation was passed uh, on campaign finance reform in the wake of that, but you were Senate president when he was Speaker. You worked very closely together. On a personal level, what went through your head when you watched him go off to prison this week? It was very sad, um, as you said. Uh, we were colleagues in the building and worked on a number of um, challenging issues together, including pension reform with the governor, then general treasurer. And it was a very sad day for the state and a very sad day for me personally. Uh, when, uh, when he was being sentenced, former House Speaker uh, Bill Murphy, his attorney, said that this case might uh, mean we should take a look at considering a full-time legislature. What do you think? Uh, certainly, personally, I've always supported a citizen legislature because I think it brings people from different walks of lives. Um, however, certainly every 10 years it's worth considering, you know, the entire, should we be unicameral, should we uh, have a two-year budget sure cycle, <laughs> should, you know, yeah, just one chamber, just the one Senate. Chamber, right. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, should we have a two-year budget cycle? That's an issue that I've often thought would be good to look at. Uh, I believe Maryland has that, where you have a better plan. Uh, and, and a lot of what we did this year with this governor kind of looked at a two-year cycle, Medicaid re reinvestment, and some of the steps that we took. So I, I do think that it's always uh, valuable to re-examine our structure of government. 
uh, and whether or not a full-time legislature makes sense with the realistic that they'd have to be compensated um, sufficiently uh, for a full-time job if you want to attract uh, people to these positions. And it certainly is worth investigating. There's about nine states, I think, that do the part-time legislature, but I don't think it's a panacea. Uh, I think actually majority leader in the House was quoted recently in the paper saying, or minority leader in the House said something to the effect of people going to do something wrong, whether you're part-time or full-time, they're going to do something wrong. Um, you knew on the show we were going to ask you about politics. There's always speculation in the State House about uh, the political future of the leaders, including yourself. When will you decide whether you'll run for re-election in 2016? Um, one thing I learned is you never decide it while you're in the middle of a budget session. <laughs> but at this point, I'm planning on running for two six for in 2016. And remaining, obviously, a Senate president. And, and after remaining, that. I have a great team. You know, one of the things that's a benefit, and I mentioned the senators on finance. I could mention Chairman McCaffrey in this judicial reinvestment uh, initiative. Uh, he and Senator Jabor will take the lead on that. Uh, Leader Ruggiero on this I-195 tax stabilization has taken it and run with it. Uh, Senator Miller on the health care issues, I trust him. Senator Sosnowski on the environment. One of the things, Senator Goodwin on all things Providence and all things whatever, is <laughs> just a, a great friend and colleague and sounding board. I, I have a terrific team. So one of the things I find as being Senate President is the chairs of the committees and your immediate leadership team are critical uh, to your day-to-day -day activities and your desire to move forward. And you don't become as much a part of the equation. What is most important to me in the Senate is the team that we've built together and the staff that we've built. One of the things Joe Montabano um, kind of allowed me to take the lead on and we've done is professionalize the staff in the Senate both the policy office and the fiscal office. When we first came to leadership, it was kind of like policy, this person policy, that person policy, this person, you know. But what we were able to do is people have job classifications now. They can move up the ladder. Um, they're treated professionally. We make sure of that. And it's something I'm really proud of. And I think that makes a difference, once again, in terms of the long-term stabilization of be it the House or Senate or any legislature. Our guest uh, this week is Senate President Teresa Piva Weed. We only have a, a few minutes left in the program, so I'm going to try and run through a couple of topics here. Uh, you're an attorney, and I'll tell you, any time that uh, you know, we'll have you on the show, a lot of people wonder if you're interested in being a judge. And there is a vacancy in the federal court and the magistrate position. Um, have you applied for it? Are you considering that? I believe that the speculation that uh, the woman who is a magistrate will become the, a judge. A, a judge. Patricia and so Sullivan. I think it would be premature at this time. It's certainly would flattering. You consider it? And I think anybody would consider it. But at this time, once again, I don't even think Pat Sullivan, I, I don't think the person has been named a judge. And given what's yeah. going on in Washington, I so think that's So let the seat pretty, cool off first, <laughs> is what you're but, saying. Uh, yeah, but I mean that. Very but that, flattering tips giving you judgeships that aren't available. <laughs> but, but certainly, and he, you're not alone. A number of people have speculated. And I, I mean, who wouldn't sit and think, gosh, that's very flattering. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Speaker Matteo, oh, no, I'm not asking that one, I'm sorry, uh, Twin River is buying Newport Grant in your mm -hmm. district and then seeking to move it out of your district to Tiverton. <laughs> What's your th thought on the proposal? Do you support it? I do, and I will tell you, the conversations I've had with the owners at Twin River focused on the future of the real estate um, in that my district. That where the casino is that's, now. that's really the question. If they're successful in Tiverton, the voters in Newport said no twice, loud and clear. So Twin River needs to be able, Twin River or any other developer, needs to be able to have some table games to compete with the Plainville that you're seeing now right. up there. And um, makes the most sense for Twin River because they'll own both facilities and they can coordinate that in a state this size. That being said, for me, I have a commitment um, from the uh, developers or the Twin River owners that they want to work with the city of Newport in developing that parcel. There's been discussions and plans about the innovation hub and about the defense industry. So I want to look at it as an opportunity for Newport. I've often said uh, throughout my career, if we'd had a blank sheet of paper, it would have been a different discussion about um, what would be built there. Um, we actually have that opportunity now to have the blank sheet of paper. We have very little time left, um, and I know it's early yet. So looking ahead, 
transportation funding plan aside, what's the one priority you have, I don't know if you know yet, for 2016 as you look to January? I think that uh, the number one priority would be the roads and bridges. We also would continue our initiative on education and job training in particular. Uh, We've lifted the moratorium on school construction, but the charter school piece and reexamining the school funding formula, I think, needs to be a priority. Do you think the state needs to step in and uh, fill the gap for cities and towns when students move from a regular school to a charter school? I think by restructuring. About 20 seconds. Yes, I think that we, um, <laughs> the, the cities are being unfairly, and traditional public schools are being unfairly impacted unless we add additional funds to the formula to address the growth of charter schools. Senate President Teresa Piva Weed, it was great having you on the program. We have so much more ground to cover, but <laughs> we got what we could get to. If you missed any of it, you can catch it online, WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White, and we will see you next week on Newsmakers.